Major support for these programs is provided by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, M&T Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Cushman and Wakefield, Dimes Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Stephen Napolitano, First American Title Insurance Company, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns and Gian Tomasi, Grubb and Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackel Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Newmark Knight Frank, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group, LLC, Siami Development, SJP Properties, Sterling and Sterling, Urban American, The Wickoff Group. <laughs>
Midtown South. There we saw a great deal of strength, in t even in terms of rents in 2007, 2008, 2009, in new leases being signed. At the same time, a lot of what we see now, in my mind, may come just from lower interest rate, not necessarily from uh, growth. And that's why I'm cautiously optimistic. I think we should really, uh, when it comes to new buildings, be very careful about which building we're and the type of tenancy in it. And, may, and also we should uh, make sure that we believe in the macroeconomic that all of what we're seeing right now is sustainable. And we'd see a great deal of improvement in different sectors. Well, as I was saying prior to the show, you know, we, we have economic conditions. We have, a, you know, the stock market reached a high, but we've had a, a crisis in the Middle East. You know, uh, your colleague in crime, Jimmy Kuhn, a couple of years ago was on the show saying, you know, the next time I'll see a hundred dollar uh, square foot rent is when I see a hundred dollar oil price per barrel. Mm. We're there. We're very close to that. Uh, we are seeing certain hundred dollars square foot, but the average rents that we were saying before, how much has rents really gone up from 2000 to 2010? I would say about 15 to 20 percent. So from 2000. So well, but actually, it, actually, if you say pre-crash, they're probably down compared to the pre-crash level. In 2000. Now, but the, the, the interesting thing that we were talking about, and I think maybe Eric brought it out before, is that when a tenant leases space, you know, it's for the novice and many people from around the world watch my show, they, they think that they're, they're renting space, but they don't realize it's an effective lease. They don't realize the, the tape measure, uh, as we call. But today, you can't get more space. The space has reached the maximum. Isn't that what you said before? Yeah, I think it's unfortunate. I think it's one of the, uh, the very very, very kind of misguided things that we do in terms of increasing loss factors. So I think the point we were making was that as rents, ris rents were rising basically through 04, 05, 06, and 07, the reality was they were really underreported because the reality was we, we measured them by per square foot, but the reality is the footage was growing, not the per square foot number was growing. So the amount of rent being paid by all the tenants in New York was actually outpacing what we were reporting as the increases in a per square foot price. So I think the reality was our rents were going up much more. Now we've kind of maxed out on the loss factors. So the idea that we can have the same rent growth going forward as we had in, in, that, in that period of time, I think, I think is misguided because we, at that point we weren't only growing the per square foot rent, we were growing the square footage. Now I think we have to stop growing the square footage and we can only grow the per square foot rent. So I think we're not going to be able to see that, that kind of same rise. You know, that's my opinion. I think, you know, as far as the, the loss factors go, I think it's a mistake that we do it. I think that's one of those things that we're, we, it, we all thought it was a good thing, but at the end of the day, I think when we look back, we realize that actually it wasn't a good thing. How does it make sense that you walk into a tenant and tell them that you're going to charge him this, the same per square foot rent, but his 10,000 foot space is now 12.5, and he doesn't think you're crazy? He thinks you're crazy. He's not surprised that you want to increase the rent. That's what we do with landlords. That should be understandable for the tenant. The idea that we tell him his room is bigger, I think that's something that, uh, that needs further inspection. Now, what about my comment that I've made to you that tenants who were signing leases are signing leases for smaller spaces and more efficient? Anyone? I think that's well, true. I mean, I think anybody. You see consolidation. We are maxing out on the square footage. We have uh, the lowest interest in a long time, and we don't have a shock absorber for any hiccup that may happen either with regards to uh, tenants expanding or shrinking, or with regards to inflation affecting the economy and therefore the growth of companies. See, but the, you know, I, th I think what you're saying is very true, but it, it primarily uh, applies to the very large tenants, so those with, may, let's say, 100,000 square feet or more. And in those renegotiations, you will see that they are able to effectively reduce their, uh, the amount of required space. I think the average they just had a statistic out that the average uh, square footage per employee is going down from, it used to be 400 square foot, and now it's maybe about 250 square foot. Right, I yeah. think there's that's been that's a substantial right. reduction for that. And as I was saying, you know, when a law firm is moving, a partner's office, which may have been 20 by 20, is now, you know, as opposed to 400 square feet, is 320 square feet. Or, you know, I, I think my, my great story is when Cushman moved to 1290 Avenue of the Americas and they had all this gigantic space at, uh, you know, at the uh, Black Rock building, 
all these people had smaller spaces, you know, and more efficient spaces, and that's what, what you're really saying, especially for the larger company. The company who's taking 10,000 square feet or 5,000 square feet is not really doing that. They're taking the space and they're trying to say, what's happening with pre-builds? Are you seeing more pre-builds? There are a lot yes. of pre-builds out there. I mean, we have right now, we, we bought four buildings over the Explain past. Explain for my audience what a pre-build is. A pre I don't want an inside baseball. <laughs> a pre-build is basically taking a space um, typically five to seven to eight thousand square feet and building it out building the offices building not building the 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 sort of the breakout spaces but the pantry the bathrooms um, and co executive offices on the perimeter um, and you see a lot of that tenants are less inclined to want to come in and build out a space they prefer to come in have a t we also call it turnkey come in and just be able to move in the next day um, and it allows the landlord to sort of showcase their property their tastes and sort of the building standard finishes. And I, there's a l tremendous amount of pre-builds out there. Have you done a lot for that? I have, for the first time. Um, at 515 Madison, we've done it. Um, I kind of think it's a little bit, for our industry-wide, it's a little bit of the snake biting its own tail. Uh, one of the things that kept tenants in place, I mean, the reality for all of us is what we needed to have happen is our tenants to stay in our buildings and renew their leases. Now we're creating a kind of a hotel concept where it's very easy to move from one building to the other. So we're lowering that, that barrier, which I think overall is really bad for landlords, making it easy for people to move. While it's good when you have vacant space, it's not good when you have occupied space. So, you know, we're similar in the sense that we have high occupancy rates. You know, I'm, I'm about 99% also. So I don't really want to make it so that people can move. The other thing about it was when people design their own space, they made it for them. They had an attachment to it. Right. It is so frustrating. <laughs> I go on pre-built tours all the time. Everybody's doing the same. The same thing. The same carpet, the same tile, the same basket lighting, the same it's tile. It's like going to a Holiday Inn. It is it's the really, same room with the same It's really bed frustrating. Same... It's, it's awful. It's awful. We're so, trying for so our how do you we're trying to bring. So how do you differentiate? You, there are three or four different things you can do. You can do a different carpet. You can do a different light. You might spend a little bit more money. Just being a little creative, a little thoughtful. You tweak three of the elements. Maybe a lighting, maybe the side lights, maybe the carpet, um, the pantry, make it a little exciting, pantry being the kitchen. Three little things you can, you can kind of differentiate Here, Here's yourself. a question. It, it relates. You know, you're at 99%. You're at 99%. All, all of you, your buildings, I mean, the ones that you're We're at about 50%. Over, you're at 50% <laughs> because, because you, you took all the notes yeah. and over there. So when you're at this number and you're a little worried about the economy, isn't it a good time to lock in uh, a long-term mortgage? It is a good time. It's just that we refinanced in 2006, so we have until 2016 to wait until we can refine. Yeah, it's not like the residential market where you can you have prepayment uh, penalties and you have to pay the fees, and so it usually doesn't pay. The only the defeasance is only if we have a securitized mortgage, right? Which we, we most uh, of us I have, mean, and most of our portfolios. Some, sometimes there's sort of a yield maintenance, not even about right. But the yield maintenance is is easy to live with in a defeasance situation right. over there. Yeah. Now, but you've you've recently refinanced. I know a couple of your buildings. Yeah. Yeah, we've been doing it. I think it is a good time to borrow money. I think, you know, we're still borrowing at probably, you know, maybe 40 or 50% of loan to value. So I think the banks like that. It's a, it's a safe bet. I think, you know, the banks for a certain period of time were more encouraged to kind of keep some of those loans on their own books. So, you know, we were the kind of properties and, and, and the kind of owners that they were interested in, in lending money to. But I think, look, rates are low. It's obviously good for us to borrow money at this time and kind of replace the existing debt that we have with cheaper debt and without question. So uh, of the markets, you know, you're, you're in a variety of them. You're, you know, we were talking before Port Authority, Grand Central. People love Grand Central because of the convenience over there. Which is the market that you feel is the strongest in the city of New York, and what do you feel is the weakest? I think Midtown is still very strong. Midtown South, uh, which is the area that's closer to Penn Station and also the area in the west side that will be developed is the one that's probably posed to grow the most. West side his, uh, has a lot of uh, plans for quite a few empty lots between 8th Avenue and 10th Avenue, and obviously the uh, rail yard. All, so that area, I'm kind of, I see a lot of growth there, but it's over time. But overall, you see strength, and you see it in pricing and valuations of building in Midtown in general. But weren't we talking before what we saw uh, of last year from, you know, uh, a low of $97 a foot? And we won't take the, the 660 Madison because that's a, a different thing. So from $97 a foot at 4 New York Plaza to 750 a foot 
at 1330, and if you really take 510, which is in a, a different type of building because it's a brand new building, it's you know have unique. It's probably close to a thousand a foot. What do you see building is going to trade for? There are a couple of buildings, as we all know, you know, on 44th Street, you know, uh, in other markets in the city. Where do you see that? I think the key is what you have asked before: is which are the strong areas? And I think Grand Central Plaza District, those areas are where you're going to see very high per square foot prices. Downtown is a different story. Have you ever bought downtown? No. We looked at downtown, but we never bought What them. about you, Ben? We have. We had quite a few buildings downtown. We love downtown. It behaves differently. I think that downtown is a good investment long term, but it goes through a lot of stress right now. You're, you're a king now, downtown, yeah, right? We, you know, we, we like downtown. Um, we just recently bought a building downtown, Five Hanover. We have a B piece on a building downtown. Um, we like the market. But to get back to your point before about you know, where will things trade, I think the market is still bifurcated. You have the cash flowing deals, you know, class A cash flowing that are trading at the seven, eight, seven, eight hundred dollars a foot, the 340 Madison, the 1330s, um, the 510 Madison. Um, and then you have the deals that we've been buying, which are where the capital stack is upside down, where there's 50 percent vacancy, where there are basically zombie buildings because the ownership doesn't have any money to do it, leasing pay leasing commissions or TIs. Um, and that's where I think the pricing is sort of, that pricing is still, although coming, kind of getting more expensive, relatively, I think, cheap. But I think that's an interesting concept about the zombie buildings and other ideas. Tenants, I think, two years ago, both tenants and brokers were very worried about who they were dealing with. Absolutely. They wanted to make sure, the broker definitely wanted to know that they were going to get paid the commission, and the tenant wanted to know that they were going to be safe in the, in the property. That world has changed a little bit. Tenants are, are more comfortable today. A, part of, a big, big push that we do on the buildings that we've been buying is to come in, announce new ownership, well capitalized, um, you know, ready to do deals. And that's why we're also doing pre-builds, showing that we have the money to put into the buildings, that uh, we're going to pay co commissions, um, and brokers are welcome, and tenants are welcome. And I think that gives tenants and brokers a, a higher ben? level of confidence. But in terms of where buildings are traded at, it has a lot to do with the deal supply. And we didn't have an efficient market in quite a while because a lot of deals were locked in all kind of debt situations. And what we're seeing now is that channel of new deals coming up, and we see a lot more deals, and it, it, that's part of the optimism. But we don't, I mean, you know, the, the surveys like this, the AFIRE survey, you know, foreign investors still want to come here. Sure. I mean, you know, uh, you know, there are five great cities in, in the USA. But you know, they're driving. New York, Washington, you know, Los Angeles is coming back, San Francisco and Boston. Some people say Chicago, but Chicago I have mixed emotions on. But they and institutional money is driving pricing to the 750 on those core deals. Yeah. And in their requirements in terms of return is totally financial. They look at it more as a bond than real estate. And the excitement that I think this core group is having at real estate is really adding value in stabilizing buildings and, and buying into the equity and investing in there. A lot of what you're seeing is really more of a financial transaction than a, a true real estate transaction. The holdings of Newmark, you know, you, you've all these buildings, as you said, uh, some of them even before you were born. That's right. Uh, <laughs> and and this, the situation is, and you're not going to sell. I mean, this is the way, it's a good cash flow, and you, you run the properties. And that's why people want to rent in your buildings, because they know it's a good landlord. That's the, that's the key. You know, the, they're not dealing with somebody who's an undercapitalized landlord, as you were saying before, uh, on this situation. But th the big question is, you know, and I think Ben brought it out prior, is if we don't have more jobs, one, unemployment, two, the oil effect at the $100 a barrel or, or greater, you know, over there, all of that's going to have an effect, you know. It's, you know, and it's also a tale of different cities, you know, even though it's downtown. I think... Uh Irregardless of what you think about the job situation, we are now all anticipating rent growth in Manhattan. And that's what all the capital market deals are based on. Strong growth in 2012 and 2013. So 
And there might be a decoupling from the US, the way you see the Manhattan market in a global context uh, that you expect. So how much rent growth do you see? I mean, uh, in 2011, 2012. I think some of the, you know, CB and CW, they're saying 10 and 12 and 15 and 13. I mean, I think a lot of the companies, the brokerage firms, are saying 25% in the next two years. We, we don't underwrite that. I mean, in 2007, to win a deal, you had to underwrite 10% annual growth but that's, but that, for the five-year. But, five that's, year but that's like my story that I told you with Facitelli when the analyst came in and said $240 a it's square foot. scary. Yeah. You're, you're not going to get that. No. You know, the, the tenant. Now, the, the interesting thing is certain companies can't afford paying this rent. You know, I, I said this a number of years ago on a show, and I'll say it again. I mean, that's why they go to, to Newmark uh, Holdings for their real estate. Where does the nonprofit, who, who's not profitable, you know, where are they going? Downtown. They're going to downtown. They They're going to 528th Avenue. They're going to some other properties. But where where can they go to, you know? Or where can that small accounting firm, you know, who who has four partners, you know, this and that? They're on the mid block. Yeah. They're not on Seventh Avenue. They're not, you know, those markets aren't there. Rents grow based on demand and need and vacancy rates. I see also spikes and I. And rents go goes up, uh, go up in spikes, but yet my my question is: Is it sustainable? And what happens if oil keeps going up and inflation somewhat comes in, and and other factors in the economy? Well, what about you, you know? You know, it's it's nice that you're able to pass certain of your real estate taxes through to your tenant but there's a base year that yeah. you have to pay the real estate taxes, and with real estate taxes and fuel going up. Somebody's paying for those expenses, and that's going to have an effect on your yield on this deal. And I think people have to take this into consideration over there of, of what's happening. Um, the far west side, where do you see it? I think long term, I think that, that has the most opportunity in all of Manhattan. I think there's, there's potentially 40, 000, 40 million square feet of space that could be built over there. You have infrastructure going in with the seven line. You have two of the main transportation hubs there. You have river views for a lot of it. Uh, you have a changing residential picture. There's a lot of cities that you talk about, Chicago being one, uh, Boston also to a certain extent being one, where the people live where they work. Where in New York that used to not happen, but now people like that because the premium on their time and their lifestyle has become more important, especially for younger people. So I think the far west side offers really a great opportunity. I'll make one comment about jobs. I think in 2008, the kind of person who got hired was the kind of person who could come in and cut your costs. If two people went for, the, went for a job, one guy said, I can cut your costs, some guy said, I can improve your, your top line. They hired the guy to cut his costs because they weren't so sure if the person could really improve the top line, but they were sure they can, they can cut your costs. Now that guy has cut the costs or, or gal has cut the costs. Now they're kind of done. The next guy to hire is the guy who's going to run your top line. So I think that's why we see some, some potential rent growth because the companies are going to hire people now who can basically drive revenue where before they were hiring the person who was going to lower costs. The costs are now down. I definitely see that. We talked about the fact that when some of these bigger companies take space, they take less space because they had an efficiency expert who came, showed them how to be more efficient. Mm -hmm. Once you get efficient, it's hard to get more efficient. There's only so, wet, so efficient you can get. The next guy to come in is the guy who says, hey, now I know how to sell some more of your product. I know how to make it better. I think those are the jobs that are going to happen. I think that's going to help all of us. Question. Google buys 111 8th Avenue. Couple of reasons on this. One of them is the proposed accounting rule where you know lease where you have to uh, put the lease on your statement. How many do you think that many companies or smaller companies will convert their buildings to condominiums so a company can have ownership? I mean, that's what happened at the building that you had on 33rd yeah. Street. You know, Francis Greenberg bought it, and he, he loves doing condominiums. He had a very difficult time in 2008, 2009. Uh, maybe 2010 got better. Do you think there'll be more people wanting ownership of uh, their own space? In the smaller spaces, it's probably, it's, uh, it requires capital, and some of these firms don't have the capital to put it into real estate for the business. So I'm not sure it's going to... Uh, See, nonprofits love it. Yeah, nonprofits love it for a variety of reasons because uh, since they don't have to pay real estate That's taxes, right. it's a great opportunity for for a nonprofit entity. We're actually spending a lot of time looking at deals and underwriting them as office condos, and a lot of the not for profits financing is actually relatively easy for the not for profits. They can finance their TIs, um, so we're looking at it. I mean, I don't love condos in general. The tax implications are. 
Right, but but I do believe, but yes, I think Brent is 100% correct in saying that many companies don't like it because it, it really locks you in. You get landlocked yeah. in your space that yeah. you really can't grow. But a nonprofit who has a limitation, yeah. or even, you know, that's why the unions in many cases had the, the space because they didn't care about the need. But, you know, a lot of that union space has moved out. I mean, we were talking a little bit about 14th Street in the yeah. meatpacking district, you know, it's very hot. But how much is, how high can it go? in certain markets. I think that's the question, like Hudson Square rents were going up to 55, 60. Now they're down to $35 a square foot. Off, I mean, Five Hanover at one time, rents were renting for $50 yeah. Yeah. a foot. Absolutely. And now it's down to 28, 30. Um, and I don't think we'll ever see 50 down there. If, if, if a tenant is watching the show, what would you recommend? I know you're landlords and you have, a, you have your own reason to be uh, greedy on this, but is it a good time? If, if a tenant, should they be leasing? Should they lock themselves in? I think absolutely. Look, 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 at, the, look at the largest commercial brokerage firms. CB just renewed for 16 years at uh, 200. Mm -hmm. um, Studley just took 60,000 square feet at 399. Yeah, but part the of the brokerage firms are starting to lock in long-term leases now. A part it's of kind it of a barometer. But, no, but part of it was also due to that their leases were up. Wilkie Farr just renewed 200 and some odd thousand square feet over at 787 7th. Their lease wasn't up till 2017. But a lot of other firms, many of the leases that were done in 2010 were leases for for tenant renewals. Mm -hmm. You know, and that has to be taken into consideration. It wasn't other situations. Um, it is a good time to lock in. I would recommend to lock in to a lease rather than buy. I think it gives a lot more flexibility to the tenant. And also, most tenants don't know how to run real estate. And I've seen tenants buying into a condominium, growing out of it, in not running whatever they had properly. And it eventually was more of a burden. One quick question. I always talk about the times that many years ago, people, everybody wanted to be in the tech business. You know, they wanted to buy internet stocks. And then everybody wanted to buy distressed debt because that was another big key. Do you think it's, it's another time that syndications of people want to buy buildings? I think overall that real estate goes back to what real estate was when we were kids. It's not, we're not gonna have the multipliers that we've seen in the 2000s. We, it's going to be just better than the money market or a CD. It's always And good. not as good as a junk bond, but it sits somewhere in between. So, so in the eminent words of this movie, The, uh, the Apprenticeship of Duddy Kravitz, which was a Canadian movie, as his grandfather said, Duddy, own real estate. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's a good investment. And on that tune, I'd like to thank Eric Gorau, Chris Schlank, Ben Corman, and Bern Pearl. See you next week. Major support for these programs is provided by Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's window company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, m and Bank. Additional support is provided by AVR Realty Company, LLC, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, James Orfanides, Centurion Holdings, Cushman and Wakefield, Dimes Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Douglaston Development, DDG Partners, Eastern Consolidated, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Stephen Napolitano, First American Title Insurance Company, Friedman LLP, Accountants and Advisors, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns and Gian Tomasi, Grubb and Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Jaffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Meridian Capital Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans LLP, Certified Public Accountants and Business Advisors, Newmark Knight Frank, RAL Development Services, The Spandrel Group LLC, Siami Development, SJP Properties, Sterling & Sterling, Urban American, The Wickoff Group.